So I'm going to let you. I'm going to let you lead sir. since you've got a bunch of questions. Well, uh, I showed it to the students. Students loved it, but a couple of my kids had some really good questions. And one of my students wanted to know what was group training like when you were trained to be a Green Beret? What was the process? How difficult was it? Compared to today, it was pitiful. So I'll explain. So you got to remember the time, 1968, the peak of Vietnam, and they needed warm bodies. So you have to keep that in the back of your head when the description of the training. So basically, um, you go from jump school, then you go to special forces training. The first month, I think it was four weeks. It might have been a little longer, but it's, it seems like it was about four weeks. It was really the indoctrination, so to speak. Um, classroom every day, learning how to read a map, how to use a compass, um, how to find yourself if you're in the woods and you've got a compass and a map, but you don't know exactly where you are. Um, that kind of thing. And then at the end of that four weeks or whatever, we go to the woods for a week and, um, they, they teach us things like, I think it was the first day we we're there. We butchered a goat and made shish kebab and carrots and potatoes and all that good stuff. And then we're living off sea rations and stuff for the rest of the week. Um, the training, again, because what I ended up doing in SOG was so secret, so super secret and classified that all the special forces training at that time was geared towards the main special forces mission, which is you go into a country and you train their resistance fighters or whatever, and uh, we were a force multiplier. So nothing, there was, the training really wasn't geared towards, because there were so few of us that went on to SOG and it being classified, I think it was mostly, we need warm bodies, let's, let's get some bodies in here and um, um, train them for what most of the guys will be doing, which would be like on A teams or um, uh, mic forces. Um, after that initial training, then you go to your um, MOS training, which is military occupational specialty. And we had five. We had light and heavy weapons. It was a combination MOS. Medics, which was almost a year long training. Um, engineers, combat engineers, uh, mostly learn how to blow stuff up and operations and intelligence. I think I'm missing something. There's five. Um, anyway, each MOS had different lengths of time that the training. So I, I wanted to be a weapons guy cause I grew up you know, with guns. And um, um, it was eight weeks of light weapons and eight weeks of heavy weapons. So in light weapons, we're learning not only about the M16, but we're also learning about all these foreign weapons that we're likely to encounter while we're over there. Um, our final test was... They took five weapons from around the world, disassembled them and put them in a box. <laughs> and we had a time limit and I don't remember now what it was, but you only had so much time and you had to reassemble all five weapons and they had to be in working order. <laughs> Pretty crazy, but um, so that was the final test. Then if you pass then you move on to the heavy weapons training. So that's where you're learning all about machine guns, mortars, 
uh, recoilless rifles, uh, bazooka, RPGs, all that kind of good stuff. So again, that was another um, eight weeks. And to finish it out, you go to the range and you're you're actually using all these weapons and um, demonstrating some level of proficiency. Um, if you were an engineer, learn how to basically blow stuff up. Um, you went to Fort Belvoir, Virginia for your training. Um, if you were a medic, some of it was done there at Fort Bragg, and then the rest of it, the majority of it, was done at Fort Sam Houston, Texas, down at uh, Brook Army Medical Center. And uh, like I said, that was almost a year. But these guys, when they came out of that training, they could do minor surgery, um, all kinds of good stuff. Um, operations and intelligence, they went to uh, Fort Halliburton, Maryland, which was kind of the Army's intelligence center, if you want to call it that. Um, okay. Weapons, operations and intelligence, medics, engineers. I'm still missing one, and for the life of it'll dawn on me later on. But anyway, you go through that training and so the guys that you've been with in that first four weeks, you're now distributed out to all these different classes. If the classes were at Fort Bragg, then they may still be your roommate or, you know, in the same group. Um, but like if they go to like um, Fort Sam for medical training, you may not ever see them again because the length of training, by the time they're out of training, you're going to be long gone to, in my case, Vietnam. Um, so once you got out of your MOS training, guys who are ready to progress to the final phase, um, you would come back together. And again, we, we spent time. And again, the training was all geared towards if you're going to be on an A team or a Mike force or something. Um, I remember one night after class, one of our instructors, and I think every one of our instructors had all been to Vietnam at least we once. Not if not. Had that question of yeah, you know, instructors have combat experience. I believe, if I can remember correctly, every single one of them had been to Vietnam at least once, if not more than once. Um, so we had an instructor that we're sitting around BSing with him after class one night because you know we're we're on the final phase. And things were getting a little more relaxed to where the instructors were more uh, relaxed visiting with us and that. And one of the guys asked him, um, what is this this secret thing that we keep hearing about, rumors about over there? And he says, it's just that. It's so secret. I can't talk about it. He says, I know what you're talking about. And when you get to Vietnam, if you go you'll get a chance to volunteer for it, but I, I just can't talk about it because it's so classified. So here we are, now our interest level is going up, up, up. It's like, come on, man, we're the baddest dudes on the block. You gotta tell us what it is or we're gonna, we're gonna go do it. So, you know, no information was forthcoming. So in our final phase, so it was called phase one, MOS training and phase two. In today's world, they call the whole thing something different. Um, in, that, in that time period, which I think, again, I think it was four weeks, may have been five, I don't know. Um, again, we're learning, I mean, we were learning stuff like, even though we weren't gonna be a medic, for instance, we're learning how to do an IV because if you're out in the woods and you got somebody that's seriously wounded or whatever, he may need an IV. So we all need to learn how to do IVs. And I think that's why to this day, I, I don't like needles. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not a fan of needles. And next, next week, next Friday, next week, 
I got to go do my blood work at the VA. <laughs> and I, I luckily, we got a girl that is so good, I don't even feel the needle going in, but I still close my eyes and grit my teeth because it's the seeing the needle. I, you know, I just can't deal with it. But um, again, we're learning different things. And of course, in the meantime, we're we're jumping, we're making parachute jumps every couple of months because you got you happen to make a jump every 90 days to stay on jump status, and that's 55 bucks a month extra pay. Next so, when you're only making 100, 200 bucks a month, that 55 is a nice chunk of change. Um, the final graduation to graduate from the special forces training at that time. The final thing was about a week to 10 days. We jump in at night into Yawari National Forest or Pisgah. One of the, I get them confused, but they're all, you know, up in the mountains. And um, you jump in and you spend this, whatever it was, 10 or 12 days. They've got um, other soldiers that have been detailed to be the aggressors. And I mean, let's face it, you know, the instructors are telling them where you're at. They're telling them to go set up an ambush to see how well we're doing. Our our training has been put to good use. And it was really cool. I think I told you on the last one that uh, the people living up there around Troy and that area, they get real involved in it. And my team, we were lucky. We had a family that cooked supper for us one night. The wife washed all our clothes because, you know, we've been in these dirty clothes for a week. Uh, but they fed us and every it, it was just really cool. Well, speaking of that, one of my students, Caleb, had a question about that night jump. His question was, what's it like jumping at night in a simulated war game? Well, OK, first of all, if you've ever seen any pictures of a combat jump, you not only have your parachute on your back and the reserve in the front, but you've got your whole rucksack with all your food and all your gear and your rifle hanging down below you. And there's about a 20 foot long nylon strap that you just pull a quick release. And when you get about 50 feet off the ground, you pull that and your rucksack and your weapon and that drops so that when you land, you don't break your legs because all this gear that's got you unencumbered. <laughs> this night jump, the Army had, uh, of course, it's the Army, so they got rules on everything. One of those rules is if the wind is 25 knots, which I'm not sure how that translates into miles per hour, but if, if the wind is over 25 knots per hour, you don't jump, period. My last name starting with a C, I don't know why, because there's A's and B's out there, but it seemed like almost every time I jumped, I'm the first guy in the door. If you're the first guy in the door, you're standing in the door for roughly 15, 20 minutes because they get to the drop zone. They throw crepe paper streamers out to gauge the wind and all that. They circle around, and by the time they do all this stuff, You've been standing in the door and the adrenaline is just driving you nuts. It's like, would you come on so I can get out of here? Well, this particular night, <clears throat> there were storms. <laughs> and a bolt of lightning. And so I'm standing, if you're looking at the rear of the plane, I'm standing in the left door. There's two engines on either side. One of those engines took a hit from a lightning bolt. And I'm standing in the door, and I see this engine burst into flames. Well, they have uh, sprinkler systems built in for in case something like that would happen. However, here I am, 19 years old. I'm standing in the door with all this gear strapped to me. And I see a bolt of lightning catch the engine on fire. And the first thing I think is we're getting ready to go down. You know, we're going to crash and burn. So the jump master tells us to start jumping a little bit early. 
Well, needless to say, you're puckered up so tight. I, I, you know, there's sayings to describe it. I won't, I won't say them, but um, um, yeah, you can imagine. Yeah. So we had we had one guy landed in a tree, and I think he broke his arm. One guy landed on the rocks in a creek bed, and he broke his back. Ooh. Another guy came down with that wind blowing 25 knots. I mean, you're you're moving. And he went into a barbed wire fence. Ouch. So we had a bunch of guys injured. And what we heard later was that the colonel who gave the go-ahead for us to jump anyway, he got relieved of command because of it. And he should have been. Um. So anyway, you know, we finally, the ones of us that didn't get hurt, we're on the ground and you form up and they put you in a truck and they take you to some beginning point and they give you a little talk. This is what you're going to be doing and blah, blah, blah. So here's your maps. You've got your compass. Go to this point and you'll meet another instructor. And in the meantime, be alert because there's bad guys out there and you may end up. And of course you got to, we're carrying M14s because every M16 that was being made was being sent to Vietnam. And at that time in Vietnam, the Marines were still carrying M14s. Um, M14 is, is uh, not a jungle weapon. It's too darn heavy and big and whatever. So, we start doing our 12 days or whatever out in the woods, uh, moving a lot of walking, a lot of humping. And you know what the Yawari and Pisca are like, up on, just like being in Laos, up one hill and down the next. And um, we go back and forth during those 12 days. They give you a series of different problems, uh, or they may tell you, okay, this is where you're at. By such and such a time today or tomorrow, you need to be at this point and you need to figure out the best way to get there. And in the meantime, you may run into bad guys. So it's a constant. Um, and the whole purpose was to get you accustomed to not just getting from point A to point B, but also watching for ambushes, which is something else that we learned in the phase two training. Um, you know, you're 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 looking at all these different things and without even realizing it, you're also learning to work with the local population because unless you go to SAG, you that's what you're gonna be doing when you get to Vietnam, if you go to Vietnam. Um I mean you could you could have gone to one of the other groups and you'd yeah. go to some you'd go to Germany or Africa or South America or Panama. But who wants to do that when there's a war going on and, you know, we all, we, we all want to go to Vietnam. And um, so when you finish that, um, that week out in the woods, all you've got left is about a week of final training, whatever. And that's where we did the, um, um, the IVs and some of that type of stuff for survival. Um, there was a lot of gear once you get, once we got to Vietnam, there was a lot of gear that we were going to be using that we had never seen before because it wasn't covered in our training. For instance, uh, a starlight scope, a, um, uh, strobe light, um, just all kinds of goodies, um, and a lot of that, it was, we need warm bodies and you can learn about that stuff on the job, you know. So there was a lady up at the Pentagon in DC named Billy Alexander, and she was responsible for all special forces assignments worldwide. And if you wanted to go somewhere in particular, you send her a dozen roses and say, here's a list of names and the serial numbers and we all want to go to Vietnam and 11 of us, we did that. And on graduation day, when they handed out, 
And as I recall, and I, I could be wrong, I don't think I am, but as I recall, we didn't even have a formal like graduation ceremony. They just call us all together. Here's your orders awarding you your special forces qualification. And here's your orders for your next assignment. And the 11 of us that requested Vietnam, we all got orders for Vietnam. One of the guys lived in Charlotte. So I took him and dropped him off in Charlotte and then took the old Highway 74 through the mountains <laughs> and got on, uh, at that time, it was US 40 all the way to Memphis and then up to St. Louis and uh, spent 30 days on leave and um, um, left for Vietnam. Well, that brings us to a good point. Me mentioned Billy Alexander, a uh, student I teach, Will, wanted to know, did you ever meet Billy Alexander? No, I did not. Seen pictures of her, some of the guys. She did come down to Fort Bragg several times. But when you're a trainee, you're not one of the privileged ones. You're just a slug that's going through training. And so big shots. Other than getting to meet John Wayne at jump school, no, I never got to meet Billy or any other important people because I was in training, you know. Um, but, but that's okay because meeting John Wayne surpassed all of that, you know. <laughs> it, it, it's um, so, uh, but I mean, some guys like wanted to go to Germany or Panama or somewhere like that because maybe they'd already been to Vietnam. Again, just get a hold of her and say, here's my name, rank, serial number. I'd like to go here. And it might take her a week or two, but you're almost guaranteed of getting orders for where you want to go, which was pretty cool because awesome. normally the military doesn't work that way. Normally somebody in the bowels of the Pentagon or somewhere decides where they want to send people and they need X number of people. And um, they just, I don't know how they do it, draw names out of a hat or whatever, but um, you get orders. Um, but anyway, we got orders for Vietnam and uh, we went. So well, that leads us into a perfect question. One of my students, their initial question about you going to Vietnam is, well, what was your first combat experience like, if you feel comfortable, Terry? Oh, I, it doesn't bother me. Huh? My first one, so when I got, you know, we went through in the last interview about how I uh, got into SOG and all that. So I'd been there maybe two or three weeks, and we're spending every day training and training and training, you know, and I've never been in combat. Um <laughs> So the word comes down that we're going on a SLAM mission. Well, what's a SLAM mission? Well, S-L-A-M stands for Search, Locate, Annihilate, and Monitor. And all it is, I don't know why they come up with these acronyms, but all it was was company-sized operations to go in and force and stir things up and they would never tell you this is part of it, but the real thing is to get yourself surrounded by thousands of bad guys so they could work airstrikes on them and kill them all. That, I mean, that, the truth be told, that was the whole purpose of it. Um, some people said, well, the Hatchet Force, which was a, my company, is a reconnaissance and force operation. Well, when you got 105 guys going into bad guys' backyard, there's no reconnaissance. They know you're there. They know you're coming because they had a spy in Saigon that told them the coordinates of your landing zone, how many of you there was going to be, and the whole bit. So anyway, um, on this particular mission, we were going into an area that um, every – Six by six kilometer AO, we called area of operations, had a designation. And this particular one was Hotel Nine. If you're going into Hotel Nine, 
you know you're not coming back the same person you went in. You're you're going to be in heavy combat. So we were to go into what was believed to be a regimental base camp area and see what we could stir up. So we got two companies. So we got a total of about 210, roughly 210 guys. The maps that we were using were not extremely accurate. Uh, we were told that they were made based upon photographs, aerial photographs taken by the French in 1952 and then made into topographical maps, which would show all the mountains and the lowlands and all, you know, all that, what a topic, topographical map does. The problem is, and the mountain where this incident I'm about to describe comes in, you look on the map and it's one big mountain. Right. It was actually three mountains straight up and straight down, but because of the triple canopy jungle, when they took the airplane photos, all they could see was trees and it looked like one big mountain. So on the map, it looks like, but it didn't. So it could take you two or three days to cover that up and down, up and down, because when you're carrying about 75 to 100 pounds on your back and you're going these mountains that are almost straight up and straight down, you're spending a lot of time resting. You know, you got to. Um, so I was up in the very front in the what we call the point. There was me our company commander and our uh, executive officer, three Americans. And we had two mountain yards who were in the very front point and my interpreter. So there were seven of us. Well, we get down to the bottom of this mountain. We fill our canteens. There's nice clear water running stream, kind of like going up there in North Carolina, what it used to be. And you could stop and get a drink of water where the water's running down the side of the mountain i wouldn't drink it today but but back then back in the 70s and early 80s you could do that so <laughs> we got to go up this next hill when you see stairs cut into the side of a mountain there's no doubt in your mind what you're fixing to run into because the monkeys didn't cut steps the elephants didn't cut steps and why would there be these steps if there's nothing up there? Well, so you know you're you're fixing to be in combat. So we get to the top, and again, according to the map, the Ho Chi Minh Trail was down at the bottom of the hill. And on the map, there was a big open area across the road. The idea was we wanted to get everybody down and across that open area and up on the high ground before nightfall, because you're always better off up on the high ground. Then they can't shoot down on you. They can't get around you so easily because they'd have to come up. So we couldn't see anything because, again, that triple canopy jungle is so thick. So here I am, my first time in combat, and I just know I'm one bad dude. I unbuckled my pistol belt and I said, why don't I take my gear off and I'll climb this tree and see if I can see out and see if that low ground actually is there. As soon as I unsnapped my pistol belt and I wasn't even getting all the words out of my mouth yet, all hell broke loose. Later, when it's all over with, it turned up we we had there was a main trail on the ridge of this mountain we were on. And we don't know if we walked up on a listening post, if there were just some North Vietnamese soldiers that happened to be on that trail. And I think, well, they knew we were coming. They knew we were there. So um, all hell broke loose. Uh, the two mountain yards were killed instantly. The captain and the lieutenant were pinned down. Uh, my interpreter and I were pinned down. My rucksack had bullets across that went, you know, because I'm laying flat on the ground. So they went right over my head and into my rucksack. 
luckily they didn't set off the block of C4 or the Claymore that I had in there. <laughs> so what are you going to do? And that's when basically instinct takes over. Um, it's like my first thought was I'm not ready to die on my very first mission, you know. So my rifle, my M16 took a bullet to the flash hider where the bullet comes out the barrel. So I couldn't fire. So now I got a gun that's useless. So what am I going to do? Well, I'm going to kill all the bad guys. So I crawled over the top of the hill, and the guys that were still coming up the hill had taken some grenades or something, um, but there was a bunch of wounded. So I got from one of the mountain yards who was wounded, I got an M79 grenade launcher and a bandolier of ammo. So an M79 is like a shotgun with firing bullets that are 40 millimeters. So probably two inch, I don't know. I don't know millimeters very well. I didn't do well in math, but um, they look like a giant bullet and they have to go 15 yards so when they come out, they spin, and they had to go 15 yards to arm themselves. Otherwise, they wouldn't go off. So me and all my brilliant, never been in combat experience says, okay, I can do this. I'm trained as a heavy weapons guy with mortars. So why don't I fire the M79 almost straight up in the air, just like a mortar, angle it just enough to where it's going to come down right in the middle of the bad guys, so that's what I did, and I killed them all. <laughs> and that was my first time in combat. And after we got the next day, after they pulled us out and all that, you know, the captain's like, well, we wrote you up for a silver star. You know, he says, that's pretty uh, pretty good on your first time out. I, like an idiot, here I am, idealistic, you know. It's like I was just doing my job. You know, um, so I talked him out of putting me in for this and looking back on it. What a fool. It would have looked nice on a resume. It still won't get me a cup of coffee, but, you know, <laughs> it, it, but it would have been nice. Yeah, but um, so we spent the night. We um, this is when I learned about explosives. We used C4 and debt cord and we blew a bunch of trees so we could clear a landing zone um, because the Ho Chi Minh trails right down below and all night long, we hear trucks pulling up and stopping and tailgates dropping and voices. So we know in the morning they're going to hit us and they're going to hit us hard. So we're knocking trees down. They, they brought a King Bee, which is one of the old, uh, Sikorsky uh, helicopters flown by a Vietnamese pilot and they lowered through the trees they lowered a chainsaw and some gas and oil and we were able because when we blew the trees you could blow the tree down but the tree's still there so we needed to cut it into small pieces and get them out of the way so the choppers could get as low as they could to pick us up and then the next day they um um, I, uh, well, <laughs> you know, there's all these Facebook groups about SOG and all that. And somebody asked that question, I don't know, a week or two ago about chainsaws and some know it all is like, no, there weren't any chainsaws. Nah, blah, blah. Sorry, dude, there were, we had, we had one and, uh, it was only used. You would never carry one on a mission because that's too much bulk and whatever but this one they brought in by a chopper and lowered it to us on a rope so that we could clear an lz um next day they came in and you know we send out the wounded and the dead first and then little by little each chopper lands and surprisingly enough for whatever reason they apparently had not set up any aircraft guns or anything to try to take the choppers down. So we got everybody out. Um, and um, I also learned how to stay awake. <laughs> you know, the 
the, the medic was handing out green hornets all night long, which was uh, basically a, it's an amphetamine, like a diet pill or something. I you know to keep, and all it was was to keep you awake, because you never know if they're going to hit you in the middle of the night or if they're going to wait till morning, and you need to be alert. And um, uh, green hornets were a mainstay the whole time I was there because. You know, that same reason, you, you know, you, you just don't know what they're going to do next. There were teams that would be hit in the middle of the night. There were teams you get hit first thing in the morning. So I, I don't want to go to sleep and get, you know, caught in the middle of an ambush and I'm not ready for it. So I always stayed awake as much as I could. There were times you'd get a cat nap or something during the day if you stopped and take a break or something. But by the time you'd get pulled out of a mission, you'd end up sleeping for two or three days. I understand. You know, because you got to come down off of that stuff. But um, so that was my first combat mission. Well, and that leads into this student also had a follow up question is that did you ever encounter flechette rounds when you were in country? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, late, I'll say probably in the fall of 69, they came out with flechette rounds for the M79 grenade launcher. So you could fire it more like a true shotgun instead of having to fire and it's got to go 15 yards to arm and all that. You could fire with flechette rounds. You could fire like if you've got masses of troops, they got you surrounded and they're coming at you in human waves. Man, that M79 with flechette rounds, I don't know how many rounds of flechette held, but um, man, it was crazy because they're like little steel darts about, uh, about that big. They're not, they're, they weren't large and that way they could put more of them in a round and um and then the um the rounds that the um um the gunships would fire they came out with the flechette rounds for them and um um you'll have to send me your email address and i'll uh send you a picture of a one of our chopper uh, crew chiefs, um, after he passed away, his son, one of his sons donated. He built a, um, 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 an actual flechette round, 2.75 inch rocket that held flechettes. And it held like some, some ungodly, like 2000 of these little darts. And he built one with a cutaway to show all the darts and everything. And uh, I got to go pick it up from the family. And, uh, of course, I took pictures of it. So it's it, awesome. it pretty cool. Uh, so there were, by the by the time I came home in the spring of 70, there was flechette rounds for everything. The the 2.75s, the, um, um, the m 79 grenade launcher and God knows what else had flechette rounds. Um, but again, if you've got a lot of troops, for instance, troops in the open and your air support has flechette rounds, that was the perfect, perfect thing to fire some flechette rounds. And you figure probably there's more than one in every square foot. You know, so, you know, you're going to kill anything that's moving out there and it would just shred all the leaves on the trees um, and it would become like a barren forest or something. Wow. Or if they're in an open field coming at you, there's nothing left. Um, so, yeah, flechette rounds were cool. No kidding. Well, yeah. And that leads into uh, this next round. Next question is that a uh, student I teach, Will, wanted to know that did you encounter a lot of uh, M72 laws, the anti Oh, yeah, we carried them. Oh, uh, in my workshop on the wall, 
is a inert M72. Whoa. Um, we we carried um, like for instance in my platoon, which was roughly 32, 33 men, counting the American squad leaders and that. Um, we would carry, there would probably be in each platoon of the company, the three platoons, um, it would not be unusual, depending on the mission, to have at least five or six laws in each platoon. Because, number one, you want to take out a truck and you want to take it out, right? Use a law. We knew by then, because Langvey had been overrun, and we knew that there were tanks. Again, an M16 ain't going to take out a tank, but a law rocket will. Um, when I get when I got shot the first time, you know, we were overrunning that uh, truck refueling station, and there was this huge bunker, probably probably twenty by twenty or something. And down in the ground plus above ground. And one of the guys, well, the guy that shot me went into that bunker and he went down and went into a spider hole in the side, cut into the side of it. So one of one of the guys that I was with, he fired a law rocket um, and blew that bunker to kingdom come. Of course, it was all bamboo. So it wasn't too hard for an anti-tank weapon to blow bamboo apart. Um, so yeah, we used, we used law rockets a lot. Um, yeah, it's extra weight you're carrying, but again, it's one of those things. You don't really need it until you need it. And when you need it, you're glad you got it because, um, it was also good about against any kind of fortifications. Like for instance, you come up on this regimental base camp area and there's all these buildings and stuff. You could fire law rockets and blow them buildings from a distance without, you know, having to risk getting in them and maybe getting shot. Yeah. So, yeah, law law rockets were the thing. Now, for the laws and that one shot, would y'all just discard the uh, initial? Yeah, they were not they were not reloadable. Now. <clears throat> That's where the North Vietnamese, you know, they carried the RPGs and they could fire a B-40 rocket and they'd have some guy carrying extras and they could reload it, kind of like a bazooka, you know, on our side. But we didn't carry bazookas out in the field, you know. Yeah, heavy. That was more, yeah too heavy and bulky. And, um, you know, when it's 120 degrees out there and you're carrying 75 to 100 pounds on your back, Every pound counts. And what are you going to use the bazooka against unless you run into a tank? And the odds of running into a tank were not that great. So, yeah, I mean, we had them back at camp. Same with like a recoilless rifle, but they were so heavy, you're not going to carry one in the woods. Um, so the next best thing was the M72 law. And like I say, we, we used a lot of them. Got the job done. Yep. Now, speaking of explosives, another one of my students, Kim, wanted yeah. to know. And so I had a lot of girls that were really interested in, in the first interview. Um, yeah. She wanted to know, well, did you care? Outside of C4, you know, she wanted to know, well, Claymores. How would you utilize a Claymore? How would you, what would you do with extra grenades? So you're, you're going to make me tell on myself. Okay. So funny story. I was not trained as an explosives demolition guy, an engineer. But I was learning. So, you know, we'd go down at night. We'd go down on the Ho Chi Minh Trail and we'd take a, a squad of guys, maybe four or five guys or maybe more, set up an ambush. And the goal was always to blow up a truck and capture the driver, you know, and bring a POW back for intelligence. So I had this brilliant idea, me and my limited knowledge of explosives, but I, I was having a ball playing with C4 and debt cord and all that. And we had these little mines. Um, they were called, we called them toe poppers. I think they were 
M26, anti-personnel, whatever. And they were little things about the size of a snuff can, actually maybe a little bit smaller in diameter than a snuff can. And to arm them, you turned like to, it clicked in place to arm it. And then if anything pressed down on it, it'd blow up and it'd blow a guy's foot off. Any personnel was what it was for. So I had this brilliant idea. Well, why not take a C ration can and fill it with C4 and then put a toe popper on top and we'll put one of them out on the trail. And the North Vietnamese were really funny because they were so afraid of us setting booby traps they would make sure that every truck in a line of maybe 15, 20 trucks, they would, it would look like one truck went through there because they would follow in the, in the track of the trucks in front of them. Kind of like guys walking through a minefield. You always want to step where the guy in front of you stepped because if he didn't get blown up. So, um, so my idea didn't last too long because I think I did it twice and then they quit letting me do it because I was not only blowing up the truck, but I was killing the driver. And, you know, there, there goes our bonus for catching a POW and all that. Um, but we all carried uh, the Americans on a hatchet force because there was more of us. Each one of us carried a one pound block of C4. And then we'd carry a roll of debt cord. Debt cord was, um, it was an explosive, but it was about the size, uh, diameter wise, about the size of, um, I don't know if any of the kids know what a clothesline looks like, but <laughs> about the size, well, you know, because mommy's got a dryer now. Back That's then probably- we used clotheslines, right? Oh. Um, sorry, kids, but I got to make some fun of you. Um, maybe just a little thicker than a clothesline rope. And what you could do with debt cord then is you could, um, oh, there's a lot of uses. For instance, you want to blow a tree, you wrap debt cord around the tree and then attach, um, an igniter And you could put a, like a fuse igniter, ignite that fuse. And when the debt cord blows, it would blow the tree. You know, you could also hook a debt cord and C4 if you really want to blow. Like, for instance, you want to blow up a bunker complex. You use a combination of C4 and um, debt cord. Um, The toe poppers were strictly anti-personnel. So normally you'd plant those on the trails where, you know, troops were going. um, Let's see, what else did we use? Well, claymores, of course, every American carried at least one claymore. Some carried two. Um, At night when we'd set up or when you're setting up an ambush, you always use claymores. You want to use claymore at the... So if you got troops coming down the trail, you want to have at least one claymore pointing to where they're coming from because (laughs) it happened so many times. You'd spring an ambush on what you thought was maybe 10 or 15 guys, and it turned out it was a point element for (laughs) a point element for a whole battalion, you know, which happened more times than uh, we could count. Um, cause you just don't know cause of the curves and the road and all that, you don't know what's behind them. Um, so claymore and at night you put out your claymores and the claymores were really dangerous because you never want to be directly behind a claymore cause it had about a 15 yard back blast area. So if you're within that 15 yards behind it, you can pretty well count on going to the hospital if you live through it. So normally we would put the claymore in front of a tree. And then um, um, there were times, especially in an ambush situation, you could link, again, you could use your debt cord and you could link several claymores together 
um, like if if you think you're going to have a larger group of bad guys coming down the trail, you only want to have to, you don't want everybody setting them off and maybe not at the exact same moment. So you hook two or three claymores together with debt cord and boom, you're going to, you're going to take everybody out in this large group of people. Um, let's see. So we got toe poppers, debt cord, C4 and claymores. And that, the only other thing really in terms of explosives, if you want to call it explosives, um, some of us would at times carry white phosphorus grenade. White phosphorus, once it's ignited, it ain't, you ain't going to put it out, number one. Um, and, uh, white phosphorus was really good on a truck to destroy a truck. Um, oh, well, every once in a while, too, we also carried a thermite grenade because you put a thermite grenade on the engine of a truck, it's going to melt that engine. Um, it creates, I don't know how many thousands of degrees of heat. Um, but the white phosphorus grenade um, was useful for a couple of things. One thing, if you would throw it against a large number of troops, when it explodes, it's sending all this, all these chunks of burning phosphorus. And like I said, you're not going to put them out and it would burn people to death. Yeah. Um, it was also good for maybe throwing in a bunker. Um, but another use for it, which of course it's not what it was intended for, but in that triple canopy jungle, if you're trying to signal the aircraft up above, if you throw a smoke grenade, well, that smoke can't get through that triple canopy jungle. So instead it diffuses out and it may find an opening in the trees where it comes out and it could be a kilometer away from where you're at. So that doesn't help you much. But if you throw a white phosphorus grenade, it's gonna go up through the trees and you let the aircraft then know where you're at because it's very hard to signal a, a plane or a chopper um, when you can't get smoke up through the trees. And um, so a white phosphorus, but white phosphorus grenades, um, for instance, uh, we had one guy that was killed back at camp. They were getting ready to go on a mission and he was going to take a white phosphorus grenade and he had it in his hand. And I don't know if he, I don't know the whole story. Did he trip or what? But anyway, he dropped that white phosphorus grenade and it cracked the outer housing. And as soon as the oxygen hit, it exploded. And he died from massive burns, you know, basically. Um, um had another incident where after that, we quit letting the mountain yards carry white phosphorus and a lot of the guys quit carrying them. Um, during a firefight, a bullet hit, he was carrying a white phosphorus grenade on his belt and a bullet hit it and again, it ignited and it killed and burned to death four or five of the mountain yards. Mm. Um, so white phosphorus had its uses, but some of these incidents, um, you had to weigh the pros and cons of it. Can I can I get along without it? Yeah, you can get along without it. So, you know, um, but that was kind of it in the uh, genre of explosives that we would carry with us. I mean, there's other stuff, but not not stuff that we would carry. Right. Well. Um, I had a question about white phosphorus. What is the range you need to be away from the grenade when you throw it? 15, 20 meters? 15 yards, roughly. Just like a regular uh, fragmentation grenade. It had a bursting radius of about 15 yards. I'm going to carry the laptop with me, but I got to let this damn dog out. <laughs> it's okay, Terry. I can ask questions as you go. He's, he's, pulling, he's pulling his usual whining. Come on. Okay. 
terrible. And I'm back. Now, okay. regarding some of the weaponry, one of my students wanted to know, because they've seen photographs of Marines and SOG personnel carrying weapons from World War II. Did you ever yep. carry a grease gun or a Thompson or anything like that? I wish I wish there was a way for me to post some of my pictures while we're talking. I had, let's see, when I first got there, the supply sergeant was named Bob Howard. Well, the reason he was a supply sergeant, because he'd been put in for the Medal of Honor twice. And they were waiting on it to come back. Is he going to get it or not? And both times it got downgraded to a distinguished service cross. Um so I'm drawing my equipment, and he's like, now, nah, you know, you can carry whatever weapon you want. And it's like, no, I didn't know that. That's cool. Kind of like being a James Bond. <laughs> and he said, okay, I'll give you a rundown. So we got this 9 millimeter submachine gun, a Carl Gustav, which we just called it a Swedish K. Very short little thing, had a folding stock, 9 millimeter, blah, blah, blah. Very slow rate of, rate of fire. Um, you could carry a grease gun. You could carry a Thompson submachine gun if you wanted to and be like a gangster. Um, we had some recon teams who wore North Vietnamese clothing. All their gear was North Vietnamese. They carried North Vietnamese like AK-47s and the uh, submachine gun, the their version of the M60 was called the RPD. Um, so there was all these different weapons, but I chose the M60. I tried a, a Swedish K. I didn't like it. Um, oh, there's even like Sten, British Sten guns from World War II. We had all these weapons at our disposal, but my personal opinion and most guys' opinion was the M16 was the weapon that was most suited for fighting in the jungle. Um, now, we had a range out behind our camp, and me being a gun guy, you know, I wanted every gun I could get. So next to our camp was an engineer unit. And they're mostly they were blacktop and the, the road between Contum and Pleiku and stuff like that. And these guys all had most of them had M14s because the M16s were going to the combat troops uh, until everybody got them. And these guys would have loved to have some M16s. So if we go on a mission and you're in heavy combat. I don't know, whatever happens, and a weapon gets lost. You just turn it in as com what we call combat loss. <laughs> so these engineers, let's see, I had a grease gun. I had a Thompson submachine gun. And I have pictures of these guns on my wall of my hooch. Um, let's see, so I had a grease gun, a, a Thompson what else did I have? I don't know. Yeah, there you go. So there's my grease gun. So you got to think about the weight. So one time and one time only, I had this, again, me and my brilliant ideas. I thought, well, the grease gun would be real good on an ambush because those forty-five caliber slugs would go through the cowling of a truck and take out the engine. The weight, the weight of a 30 round clip of 45s, nah, I could carry two or three clips of M16 for what one clip of that stuff weighed. So I took it one time and the rest of the time I just used it out on the range to play with. Yeah, it was something. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, um, um, the Thompson, I don't have a picture of it on my wall. I've got pictures of uh, one of my buddies who was later killed in action. Um, I've got a picture of him with it down on the range. Um, and we were all given 
besides our M16, we were all given uh, 45 caliber 1911 pistols. And even though I grew up with guns, I was scared to death of that 1911 because when we first got there, guys would go to town to this shoemaker or whatever he was and buy these Western gun belts or shoulder holsters or whatever. And um, so this guy had a shoulder holster and he had his 1911. Well, normally you carry a 1911, not only with a round in the chamber, but cocked. And to shoot it, you have to do several motions with your hand. You got to squeeze the beaver tail on the back, plus pull the trigger and whatever. Well, he was playing quick draw with his shoulder holster with this 1911 and locked and loaded. And it went off and the bullet went in his hip and came out his knee and he lost his leg. So I was scared to death of it. So until I got shot the first time, I never carried a backup pistol and when i got shot that time and my rifle jammed on me i started carrying a 38 uh that i traded again i traded a car 15 <laughs> to one of our chopper pilots for a 38 revolver and uh because they were still issuing 38s to the chopper guys and they would love to have an m16 or an ar-15 or a car 15 so um so I had a variety of different weapons. Um, I'm glad you mentioned the trading because uh, a student of mine, her name's Haley, she said, what, what would you trade for in Vietnam? Because I know we mentioned it previously in our earlier interview, but she said, would you trade for beer? Would you trade for liquor, food? What could you trade for? In special forces throughout Vietnam, not just in SOG, we were expected to live off the local land. So the army did not provide us with food for meals. I mean, we had a mess hall, but it, the army didn't provide food that was. So trade goods was, so we would go to places like when I first got there in between the main camp and where I was at, there was about three or four miles in between us. There was a, um, supply depot for the fourth infantry division so we'd go down there and we'd trade m16s or captured north vietnamese equipment and we'd trade them to this guy that was in charge and we'd drive out of there with truckloads of food i mean literally we were eating steak three or four nights a week <laughs> <laughs> yeah we were we were eating pretty good um but it was all by trade um when I got shot the first time, I had the rifle that I got shot with because he didn't need it anymore, you know. Right. And my bullet had hit the bolt, of, so he's firing, and my bolt hit my bullet hit right here. You know, if if the gun wouldn't have been up yet, it would have got him right in the face. Anyway, I had that rifle and I put it in my locker back at camp. And a month later, when I come back from the hospital, the rifle's gone. And it's like, where's it at? Well, the sergeant major took it and he traded for some floor tile for the club. <laughs> we're always trading. People were, there was always somebody that wanted something. Um, I went down to play coup one time to where all our choppers came from and went in this mess hall. And lo and behold, that the mess sergeant had been my mess sergeant way back before I even got in special forces. I hadn't seen him in probably two years. And um, um, <laughs> so we're talking and he said, here's the deal. I have X number of people assigned to my mess hall. I have to draw rations for that X number of people every day. I got to draw food to feed that number of people. Half them guys are pilots, so they eat steak over in the officer's club while these guys are eating SOS or whatever. Hey, so I got all this extra food. What's SOS? Know? Did it on a shingle, you know. <laughs> uh, matter of fact, I had it for supper last night. Um, so he's like, I got all this extra food. And he says, I said, well, what would it take to get some of that extra food on a more regular basis? And he says, 
Well, I want to redecorate my mess hall, and it would be really cool to have some captured stuff on the walls, you know, like an AK or anyway. I said, okay, next time I come down here, we're going to furnish your mess hall. So we left that day with a two and a half ton truck and a three quarter ton truck full of including, you know, the big cardboard things that ice cream, when you go to Baskin Robbins, yep. had a couple of them packed in ice. I mean, we had everything. And I mean, we're eating like kings. So I had my mountain yards go back to their villages and get some like crossbows and knives and stuff. And Mama San down in town in the tailor shop, we had her make some North Vietnamese flags and we took them out on the range and put some bullet holes in them and kind of scorched them to make it look like they'd been in combat. And we take all this stuff and we would trade for mostly for food. I mean, there were times we also went up to Da Nang and the Navy, you know, the docks were right there. And again, for the right stuff, we'd have a helicopter come in and lift off pallets of plywood and building materials, uh, tin for the roofs to build buildings for either the Americans or our mountain yards. So we were trading for, you name it, we'd trade for it. I mean, if it could be traded for, it was traded for. And in the meantime, we ate like kings, you know? I, I can't apologize for eating steak three nights a week. I wouldn't apologize for that either. No, I mean, uh, so we ate pretty good. But it's a big letdown because then you go out in the field and you're either eating out of MREs or um, C rations. And our C rations were dated 1952. <laughs> and they were still edible. But, I mean, C rations were gross. I mean, ugh. Ugh. So, so yeah, we traded for... Just about anything you can imagine. Weapons. Um, I had two Browning 25 automatic pistols that I brought home. Um, I had a Smith & Wesson 22 snub nose revolver. Um, and just, you, you name it. I mean, um, and it depended on who you were trading for. Because, like, for instance, we would never trade a weapon to a Vietnamese, you know, something like that. Um, it was always to a, an American, you know, depending on what they wanted. Um, uh, I had a house down in town where my girlfriend stayed. I paid for that. It, it cost me two cartons of cigarettes a month for that house. And when I say a house, it's more like a big room. But um, a carton of cigarettes was $2.40 at the PX. So it cost me $4 and 80 cents a month rent. Um, I didn't smoke. So my ration card, you know, I got my cartons of cigarettes and then trade goods, you know? Um, so yeah, a lot of trading went on. Well, and that leads me to ask this. Um, I've interviewed a lot of Marines and they talk about when they would get rations of beer and it would be shitty Vietnamese beer. And so I know a lot of the SOG uh, bases, you guys were able to get beer. Were you able to get American beer or were you still? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Hey, yeah. Um, well, number one, you could go to the PX and buy Budweiser, um, Schlitz, which is probably the worst beer in the world. It's worse than the Vietnamese beer. Um, um, Carling Black Label. Um those were the main Budweiser at that time. I drank Budweiser. Now I, I don't drink at all, but um, you could actually buy it at the PX. But if you knew the right people and you had the right trade goods, I mean, our club was fully stocked with hard liquor and beer. <laughs> I mean, what can I say? You know, um, it's a club. You got to have liquor and you got to have. And we were authorized on our ration cards. You were authorized. I don't. I don't even remember now. Was it one fifth the liquor a month or right. two? I don't know. But again, it's a matter of knowing the right people and 
you know, um, having the right price. I had a refrigerator in my room. One of them little today, we call them apartment refrigerators. You know, they were about 100, 120 bucks at the PX if you could get one. Well, the guy at the PX, he wasn't above taking a bribe. So I had my refrigerator. And he probably went back home and told all kinds of war stories when, truth be told, he was a clerk in the PX, you know. But, but I had my refrigerator. There's plenty of pictures of it. I had, uh, God, I had several reel-to-reel tape recorders, one of which I still have. Um, you know, it, it's just all according to what you want. Some guys smoked a lot, and there was a lot of trading that went back and forth. Okay, my ration card, I don't need all the cigarettes that I'm entitled to this month, so I'll get them, and you can pay me for them, and so, like cigarettes, two dollars and forty cents a carton. Uh, a case of beer was two dollars and forty cents a case back then. Of course, twenty-four, so it's ten cents a can. You know, things have come a long way since then. Ain't that the truth? Um, so yeah, I mean, um, there was American beer. The Vietnamese beer was called Bami Ba, which was the label said beer B I E R 33 and you take a bottle of it and it's in an amber colored glass bottle. You hold it up to the light and about a quarter inch on the bottom was crud. And the, the, the running joke, and I don't know how true it may or may not have been was um, uh, they use formaldehyde as a preservative for the beer. Uh, that's some of the worst tasting stuff ever. Ugh. Well, I'm about to get us both maybe in a little trouble, but uh, I wanted to use one of your photographs to show it right here. That's beer 33 right there. <laughs> yeah, buddy. That was back when I had hair. <laughs> yeah. Um, I was in... Uh, I was over in the barracks, you know, and it's not just me. A lot of us, we loved our mountain yards, and I've talked about that before. You know, when you go to the woods, your life depends on these guys covering your back and whatever. And I spent a lot of time with my yards, whether it be drinking, partying, or like in the evenings, I would teach English to them, and they would teach me their dialects. Um I guess there's pictures of me floating all over the internet. I, <laughs> I do my know? research. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, and on another podcast that I, I did, we, uh, somebody was asking me about the drink. And then, you know, the best way I can explain it other than just because you enjoy drinking is, again, considering the times, the late 60s, here we're all 19, 20, 21 years old, and you're in combat and you're dealing with losing your buddies, either being killed or in some cases even gone missing in action, stuff like that. How do you cope with that? Well, for a lot of us, not just me, but for a lot of us, drinking was the answer. Yeah, there were some guys that did drugs, but back then, other than a rare, rare occasion, and I've only heard of one, um, marijuana was the deal. They could go to town and buy what today would be like your extra large size Ziploc bag full of grass for 500 piastres, which was about $4.80 American money. And that that had last a guy. for, But most of the guys, it was drinking. Right. Um, you can go to the club and drink the hard liquor and sit around and swap lies or war stories with the guys. I preferred to, I had a refrigerator. I preferred to drink in my room by myself. And, you know, after a while, uh, when I came home the last time, the month I was home on leave, I was drinking two cases of Bud a day. My brother worked at a grocery store. 
I had a brand new Corvette convertible and I would spend my days drinking beer and driving around looking for women. And when I left home then to go to Fort Bragg, I went cold turkey and I thought I was going to die, you know. <laughs> and then over the years I drank and then, then I discovered margaritas and oh. that became my go-to. And um, now I'm not supposed to drink at all because of my diabetes, thanks to Agent Orange. But um, I can I can get away with drinking a margarita every once in a while, you know, or in the summertime, maybe a ice cold beer. But one one is my limit because it messes up your blood sugar and all that. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, so the way of dealing with death and all that, for the most part, was drinking. Well, um, it's interesting yeah. you mentioned that. I taught some students today um, about the coping. How do you cope with it? You know, you don't have a psychiatrist there. I mean. You don't have anyone there to work you through the problems. You got to figure it out yourself. And it's either rely on the guys around you or rely on the liquid around you. And, you know, we were running so many missions that you got to remember that a guy gets killed. They pack his stuff up almost immediately. An officer packs up all his personal stuff, sends it home. The body is sent on to be sent home. And other than doing a toast to him in the club one time, it's all, it, it's not, it's not saying that he's forgotten is not the right way to say it, but he's forgotten. He's gone. He's gone, never to be seen or talked to again. And you're so busy. You may, you may be going out the next day on a mission, you know, so you don't have time to dwell on um, the death. So what you do is when you're not out on a mission, you're in the club or in my case, in my room, you're drinking yourself silly. Um, and that was the coping mechanism. Um, when you came back to the state, well, I got to preface it with in SAG especially, because almost nobody stayed their 13 month tour. We extended in six month increments after that. Why did we do that? It's because we became adrenaline junkies. You're, you're looking for that next firefight. You're looking for the next time you can pull the trigger. You're looking for the next time you can work airstrikes and drop napalm on a hundred guys coming across an opening at you. Um, you just became You didn't be, you didn't become, um, what's the right word? Um, you didn't become immune to all the death and dying and whatever, but because you were an adrenaline junkie, you looked for the next fix. And that fix was another firefight or the thrill of going out there and snooping around for a week and not being found. Uh, you're, but you're always looking for that next adrenaline fix. But then when you come back to camp, you got you, you, the letdown, you know, and it was just like coming back from Nam to the stateside duty. Oh my God. Stateside duty was the worst. I mean, it was pitiful. And, um, Again, okay, so drinking. So that's why there was such a high rate of alcoholism within the military is because once you're once you're that adrenaline junkie and you can't get that fix anymore, what are you gonna do to get the fix? Well, you drink. So yeah. Um there was no such thing as going to a shrink. The closest thing that I know of to uh, somebody going to a shrink was when I got shot the first time and they sent me to the hospital in Japan for a month, when it came time to come back, they give you this sheet of paper where you can select your preference of where you'd like to be sent. 
And one of the options, of course, was Vietnam. And they said, well, for special forces in Korea, and uh, you got two choices, Korea or Vietnam. And it's like it's cold in Korea and there's no war going on. And I selected Vietnam. And they said, well, you got to go see the doctor. And it's like, what doctor? And Well, he's a shrink. You got to go explain to him why you want to go back to Vietnam after being shot. So I go see the shrink and he's like, well, why do you want to go back to Vietnam? And I said, well, it's a 13 month tour. I've only been there six months, so I got another seven months to go. And it's what I signed up for. So he's like, okay. And he signs off on it next. And that was it, you know, but even coming back to the States, I never heard of anybody going to see a shrink. I'm sure there probably might have been some, but I never heard of anybody um, going to see a shrink. In today's world, it's completely different. You come back every time you get deployed for six months or three months or whatever, you come back, you go see a shrink. You know, it's a whole different world. Um, like a lot of the Marines you probably talked to, some of them guys may have been out in the woods and very rarely ever came in from the woods. Yeah, we weren't out in the woods every day for months on end. But when we did go to the woods, it was high intensity, you know, pucker factor um, stuff. So it, it balances out, right. you know. Um so let's see. That's about it for shrinks. I mean, I just can't, I don't have any stories other than mine. Well, and for today, because I know, you know, you've got dinner getting ready to happen in itself. One good question, and this is for me. Um, I've got plenty of more student questions for the next one, but I've, I found a oh. photograph on this SOG site um, taken by you, and I was curious about it. Uh, it looks like some R&R perhaps, but uh, I was hoping you could elaborate and hopefully not get us both in trouble. <laughs> um, periodically, there would be um, mostly when you're in the outlying areas, mostly it would be Filipino bands that would come around and they'd do a little floor show one evening. And then um, the officers were all standing in line to see who gets to have the gal for the night, you know, <laughs> us poor guys. Um, normally those shows ended up with the gal totally stripping down, you know, to get all the guys excited and get their blood flowing. Um, but some of those singers were really, really good with English. And they, of course, they're all singing American songs that, that were popular at the time. Um, I only saw, I guess in the year and a half I was there, I think I only saw two of those floor shows. And I have pictures from them. Um, but uh, but they were there. You know, the Bob Hopes and the USO shows and all that, those were in the really big bases where there might be thousands of guys, you know, watching. Um you know, we didn't have that kind of stuff. What we did have that really nobody else had was Martha Ray. Um, she would come around and come to the, she came to our camp one time. I never got to see her. I heard about it after the fact, but um, um, she was a two-fisted drinker. <laughs> but she was also in real life, she was a registered nurse. And there are stories about camps coming under heavy contact or whatever. And there are stories of her pitching in as a nurse, taking care of guys that have been seriously wounded. She was, an, I guess, an emergency room nurse right. or a critical care nurse or whatever. And uh, she she put her time in as a nurse, too. Wow. And that's why she was made an honorary lieutenant colonel in special forces. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, but yeah, these floor shows, um, I only saw, I think, two while I was there. Um, 
Well, I mean, and I think for today, that's a, that's a pretty good stopping point to end on is on well, the It's up to you. We got about 23 minutes. So, I mean. Well, if, I got a question from a student here. Um, well, the boss is not home yet. So. Hey, listen, I'll roll with it. Yeah. Uh, continue with this on. And this student, her name is Haley. She wanted uh, you to describe the Ho Chi Minh Trail in detail. I know you mentioned it um, a little bit, but she was curious about was the Ho Chi Minh Trail always the same? No. Um, matter of fact, if you apparently have access to some of my pictures, I, do. I have some really, really good close-up pictures of the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Um, let's just say that the Ho Chi Minh Trail is kind of a generic term that we use for a number of things. You have your main highways, which primarily were for truck traffic coming from the north, coming down. So they would be wide enough for trucks to go by on um, and bicycles. Uh, they were hard packed. Um, in a lot of areas, the, um, the bamboo would be folded over and tied somehow tied together. So it would kind of show, provide protection from the airplanes. They, you couldn't see them from the air with the bamboo pulled over. Um, then there were two different types of, again, the generic term trails. They'd be footpaths. You had some that were what we called high-speed foot footpaths, which would be maybe wider. They might be three or four feet wide. And there might be, those were generally used for moving large numbers of troops and there may be two abreast or something. And um, um, then there were just footpaths, which may be single file or something, which would be small groups of guys. And, um, uh, but all told, all those different ones put together was just the generic term of the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Um, I've got some, there's some of my pictures are really good because I was standing on the Ho Chi Minh Trail taking the pictures. Wow. And um, Now, I don't yeah. have access to those, so after this, well, I'll have to see if you can email me those. That would be great for the next well, one. Where, wherever you're getting your pictures from, somebody obviously has all of my pictures because I've only sent a CD with all of my pictures to three people. It's on this uh, SOG site website. That's Bruce Christensen out in California, and he's got all my pictures. Well, I'll have um, to do some better scourging and finding these ones on the trail. But on uh, go ahead. On another note, you know, just keep in mind the trail. <laughs> when you use the term trail, you you tend to think of a trail, you know, that a person walks on, but really. It was a combination of all these different types of trails and roads. Um, some of the roads were very sophisticated. Like normally a foot trail would go alongside. Generally, they followed the water, the rivers and stuff. So because everything winds around and you're going through valleys, you can't go up the mountain. So a lot of times there were bridges. There were, there were bridges, um, actually, they were pretty smart. They would build the bridge underwater so you couldn't see them from the air. And, and there's stories of sometimes a recon team would find an underwater bridge and they would call in airstrikes on it. And by the next day, that underwater bridge had been rebuilt and was in use again. Yeah. These guys... These guys, the North Vietnamese, were not a bunch of backwards hillbillies from North Carolina. They were, they were uh, very well trained, but you had different groups. And the transportation battalion is what took care of maintained the roads and all that. And they had bulldozers, you know. Would this be they had all that kind of stuff. Okay, that's me. Kind of in the middle there. That's me sitting on the edge of the road after I got shot. Uh, but this was this was a big trail. This was this was one that was used by trucks. Um, 
and that's why we were in there in the first place. Um, then, and I would say this would be an average size for a trail of, or a roadway that handled truck traffic. Wide enough for trucks, maybe even wide enough in places for the truck could go past the bicycles because they had a lot of supplies coming down on bicycles. These guys would walk along the bicycle, but they'd have a 200 pounds of stuff tied onto the bicycle. So, so yeah, this this would be an average, uh, what I would call a typical view of the trail um, that was used for truck traffic. Well, and I think it's an actual visual, but I think what strikes me the most is the bicycle aspect. I believe. Oh that- yeah. I believe a lot of Americans underestimate the versatility of the North Vietnamese during the war. Oh, yeah. Um, the, um, for instance, um, there could be a what I'd call a, you know, a convoy of trucks might be 15 or 20 trucks. Well, you'd have the same thing with bicycles. You could have a convoy of bicycles and every one of them. I've never seen or heard of anybody riding the bicycles. They they would walk alongside, but they'd have up to maybe 200 pounds of gear strapped onto these bicycles, and they're just pushing them along. So they were they were very ingenious, um, you know. Uh, okay, so the trail, where are we at now? Another one of my students, Cody, wanted to know, did you ever encounter tunnels? Yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, Lord. The Vietnamese, the North Vietnamese, they were masters at tunnels. I mean, there were situations where, like when they invaded Cambodia, they go in there and they find this tunnel complex that included a full-blown hospital underground with operating rooms, air conditioning, uh, dining halls, um, hospital ward, you know, with beds and everything. Oh yeah. Um, so we went in one time on a, on a BDA, which was a bomb damage assessment. So a bunch of B-52s flew over this regimental base camp area and bombed the hell out of it. In somebody's mind, Nobody could live through that. So we get on the ground and we're we're going in these tunnels and bunkers and stuff. There's hot rice literally still steaming on the tables because they caught them at breakfast. And we're on the ground before all the dust is even settled. And we're looking and we're just marveling at all these tunnels and complex. And within an hour, we were in heavy contact with all these bomb, all these B-52 bombings. All they did was piss them off because they're in their bunkers. And these bunkers are so well built that even the 2,000 pound bombs from the B-52s did minimal damage. They knocked down a lot of trees, but that's about it. And so, um, like I say, within an hour of getting into this complex, we're in heavy contact because these guys now are all pissed off at us and they're going to do their thing. And it was hard to get the powers who be to understand that these B-52s were not as effective as what you would think they were or that they would be. And so, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, but they were masters at building tunnels and bunkers and stuff. Um, you can't take the credit away from them. You just can't. Well, and it's like a 2,000 pound bomb. We're talking a ton of explosives. In it. You're talking about a hole big enough to put an apartment building in. I mean, it wouldn't be that deep, but as far as diameter, you're talking a hole that could be 100 feet across. And maybe 20, 30 feet deep. But you're still not destroying all their bunkers and tunnels. Just because they're so fast. Yeah. Now, in SOG, we didn't have what 
in inside of South Vietnam, a lot of these infantry units had what they called their tunnel rats. They'd pick the smallest guys and they'd go through these tunnels. And a lot of times there'd be booby traps like snakes or maybe a grenade on a tripwire or something like that. But we didn't, we didn't have all that. Um, we'd find tunnels or bunkers like that. We'd plant C4 and debt cord and, and blow them up because the bombs weren't blowing them up. That's you know? right. So. Now, with that being said for bomb damage assessments, and this is factors into uh, another question that I had came up with, when you go out on operations and you'd be in contact, would command want you to get a body count or an estimate of how many you had engaged and killed? With us, nah, not so much. I mean, of course, they always like to hear body count, but it was a known fact that with the type of missions we were running, most of your enemy killed are not going to be from us, but it's going to be from the airstrikes. Sometimes the forward air controller, like if you get 100, 200 troops coming across an open area and flechette rounds or napalm or gun runs take them out, yeah, he might be able to fly over and say, well, roughly I count 200 on the ground. Well, then you could multiply that by some kind of multiplier because all the ones you can't see. But as far as us actually on the missions, you didn't do body counts. You know, yeah, you might be able to say, well, I killed three guys in this patrol or whatever, but nothing to them. Not what you generally think of when you're talking body counts. That was really more for the Air Force over there. So, well, and with that too, um, I mean, thinking about the contact that you would engage in, I guess it would be dangerous to try to do a body count or try to go into the contact because there's more NVA. Exactly. Uh, generally, when you got in contact, number one, if you're a recon team, you're going to try to get the hell out of Dodge as fast as you can because you know that there's more of them than there is of you at some point in time. Now, you may have run upon a small patrol, but they're sending for help. And when all the shooting starts, people that are a mile or two away, they can hear all that shooting and they're going to come to the sound of the shooting. When you were like me in hatchet force and there's, say, 105 of us out there, we're making a lot of noise. But we're also because they knew we were coming in the first place because of their spy in Saigon. They've already diverted troops in significant numbers to come after us. And like I was talking earlier, at nighttime, you hear trucks pulling up all night long, dropping the tailgates, you hear voices, you hear whistles, you hear whatever. And um, 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 it's all a, a matter of scale. I mean, um, you just deal with it the best you can, but there ain't going to be no body counts. It's whatever the whatever the airstrikes take out, they take out. And the whole key is to get us out alive. So, yeah, you don't have time to worry about body counts. Now, a recon team, they got three guys diddy bopping down the trail that are not aware that they're there. Okay, they, they, sh they shoot all three of them. They kill two of them, and they try to wound one in the leg so he can't run away because they want to take a prisoner, but they're also searching all three of them for documents. And there's been times when they kill like a high ranking officer that had some key documents on him that provided um, 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 intelligence about opera, uh, stuff that the North Vietnamese were doing or had planned. So, um, you know, so it always it wasn't always about how many bodies can you pile up. Well, that I mean, gathering that intelligence allows you to know well, what divisions are operating in the area, what regiments. And that's why truck drivers were so prized as POWs because they're coming down 
they know what units are they transporting. Oh, we're transporting the 66th NVA regiment. Okay, well, the regiment, 500 men is 66th. Last time we heard from the 66th, they were over here. Now they're over here. And that that was really useful information. So truck drivers were truck drivers and officers that were carrying bags full of documents. Those were probably the two key um, POWs that you would want to catch. Now, were you ever on any uh, missions, any kind of slam missions or responses where you ended up getting a POW? No. <laughs> no. Killed, killed a few, blew up a few trucks, but yeah. <laughs> and really, uh, Hatchet Force, I don't know if the Hatchet Force ever did get any POWs because there were so many of us and they knew we were there. You know you're going to end up in a firefight or more than one and have to get pulled out under fire. And so the opportunities for snatching a POW were not as great as a recon team. Because right. if a recon team could get in there for a couple of days and just not be found and they could observe the trails and whatever, they're likely to have a greater opportunity for snatching Joe Blow, it's Diddy bopping down the trail by himself or, or two or three guys coming along, you know. So, yeah. I don't know. I honestly can't think of any hatchet force. Well, that's, that's not true. Very rarely would a hatchet force ever have an opportunity to get a prisoner. But it happened. Just not. It was so rare that generally you'd. Don't even think about it. Right. Well, and I just had a question pop into my head that I hadn't thought about yet. But when you're on these operations, you've got a radio, of course. What was the call sign for the Hatchet Force team when you would go out, your specific platoon? Oh, every one of us had a um, code name because, you know, you don't want to use real names in the air and all that. And you don't want the bad guys because they're listening to our radios anyway. Uh, so everybody had a code name. So whenever you'd call, whether it was the Leghorn relay site or you're talking to your forward air controller or whatever, you're just using your individual code names. Um, you know, it, it's not like, oh, this is Operation XYZ because we didn't do it like that. It's just you're using your code name and that was it. So they always know who they're talking to. Now, do you remember your code name? Yeah, it was Tornado. I didn't pick it. Some guys say they were get well. I guess all of us. When you first signed up, you were you could either pick a code name or have them assign you one. And I wasn't very creative, so I just said, "Pick one for me," and they gave me Tornado. So it was Tornado. You know. <laughs> I don't know, but yeah, that's, but some guys picked their own. Some were unique. Some like mine were kind of run of the mill, just, just a name. Well, maybe and, it's because you partied so well, you were a tornado when you partied. So yeah, really, really. <laughs> so. Well, Terry, I think that's a good stopping point for today. You know, the, I know the bottom okay. is home and. Um, I think this was excellent. The students really enjoyed it. I mean, I've enjoyed this and <laughs> what you got to say. Well, I, I think you can see that a lot of times a question leads to another story. I love it. So um, seems like Haley asked, asked a number of questions. She was really into it. Um, and so Cody asked a couple. The, so Haley, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, her grandfather was in the Army, I think, in 67, 68. So a lot of these kids, you know, that's their grandparents were, were there or knew someone. Oh, yeah. that uncle. So it sparked interest. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's like my fourth period today. I went and taught another teacher's class, uh, English teacher, like I mentioned earlier. And I asked the students, well, how many of your grandparents or you know great uncles were in vietnam and about half the class raised their hand and i said well talk wow I said 
you know, ask questions because if you don't know the story and if they never start talking, then who will? Yeah, I mean, um, I've got four sisters and not a one of them has a clue to what I did. My daughter doesn't have a clue to what I did. And they don't care because they all got their own lives and they're all they know. I was in Vietnam and got shot a few times. And that's about it. They, they just, you know, they've got their own little lives and, you know, they do their own thing. And, you know, thanks to us, but they don't see it that way. They, they just, you know. So, I mean, uh, that's what's good about the podcasts and your your thing um is because once we're gone the stories are they won't be gone but you won't have the live story don't forget about the ones who do care well yes honey my wife's like don't forget about the ones who do care she's she's my biggest fan but you know <laughs> but uh but yeah i mean um um there's a lot of the families that and you gotta part of it i think is because the 20 year non-disclosure when we came home, we couldn't talk about it because I don't want to go to Leavenworth for 20 years. Understand and so by the time in 1991 or 92, when it got declassified so they could give us the presidential unit citation by then everybody's moved on to their families and all that stuff. And, um, you know, it, it's not at the top of their list of things to talk about today. So, you know, it's too bad, but it, it is what it is. Well, you know. I'm, I'm fortunate to be honored. You know, to... But <clears throat> so between Bud and Jason, you know, we got a lot of these podcasts going and uh, I, 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 I'm kind of blown away because I think, one of mine's got over 8,000 views and one of them's got 7,000. And it's like, where in the hell are all these people coming from? So I, when I, I published yours, I think yours has only been up for six or seven days. It's Yeah, got, but I've been getting comments right and left on it. It's got 7,000. I was shocked by it. It's taken what? off. Yeah, seriously. It's got so, put close to 7,000 views. Oh, my God. See, I to me... This is all really humbling. And again, I think it's just because, you know, I'm pretty laid back and I'm not looking to write a book. I'm not looking to make money off of any of this. And so when I see those kind of uh, views, that numbers, it just blows me away. It, it's crazy, you know. Wow, man. So, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I can say this, that. Um, and this is with your interview, and this is with several of the ones I've done. Once uh, my students figured out that I was doing this, they go home and they'll watch these. Those that are really into military history in Vietnam, they watch them. And they'll come back and they'll tell me, well, I really enjoyed this part of Mike or Terry's video. That was really cool, Mr. Wood. And then they'll be like, can you ask them this next time you talk to them? Like, I want to know about this. And it's yeah. awesome to see that what the kids want to learn. And I get hit up almost – Almost daily, I get people getting a hold of me on either Messenger or some Facebook, you know, asking asking me questions because they listened to one of the podcasts and they had a question about this or that or the other. And I know that some of our guys are not as open as some of us are. I don't understand it, but that's their thing, you know. And... Um, uh, um, I'm just <laughs> funny story. Um, you know, I started doing a uh, podcast with Bud Gibson and I call them Bud casts, but, um, <laughs> there's a, uh, there's an army surplus store about five miles from me. So one of my leather working students is a retired Colonel and he was a ranger and airborne and all that stuff, but he wasn't in special forces. So we were going to get some leather supplies about two hours from here down in Springfield, Missouri. And when I take the back way to get on the interstate, we go past this army surplus store. 
So once before, when we went, he made a comment, oh, I've never been in that Army surplus store. Yeah, I didn't think anything of it. And we go on two hour drive. And so this day going, he makes that comment. Coming back, he makes the same comment as we get off the highway. He says, oh, I've never been in there. So I pulled in there and he says, what are we doing? I said, well, you said you've never been in there. So um, let's go in. So we go in. And uh, I'm looking for the power cord. My laptop is sending me a message. Um, um, <laughs> so we go in, and I'm um, looking around. And specifically, I was looking around for another hat that says Purple Heart or Combat Veteran Vietnam, either one. But I wanted one out of this nylon material because it breathes better. And they didn't have any. And they were in the process of redoing their display of all their hats. So this one young guy, he's probably in his early 20s. He's staring at me. And I'm like, what the hell? And he says, excuse me, sir. He says, were you in SOG? And I said, uh, yeah, I was. And he yells to his two buddies and he says, whatever the guy's name was, he says, this is the guy you're always talking about. <laughs> so they've been watching these podcasts. <laughs> and I had mentioned where I live and that I live close to Fort Leonard Wood here in Missouri. And then here I am in, in the flesh. So then they want to pose for pictures, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And it's just, I mean, I'm laughing. I, I'm taking it all with a grain of salt, but it's actually, you know, it's kind of funny. Awesome. But it's also kind of cool, you know, and um, um, yeah, it's funny. So sometimes when I do the podcast now, I'll do I'll do a shout out to the guys at uh, Burns Army Surplus, you know, <laughs> <laughs> just, hey, it's cool. You That's know, awesome, man. They're, 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 they help put that number of views up, you know, so, well, you know. it's. It's awesome to see the people that want to hear the story of Terry. 7,000. Yeah, man. God. So, you know, and my stories are, it's not that they're like I'm some big war hero or something. And it's not most of them stories. Most of the other guys that were over there can tell similar stories. It's just, I don't know, maybe it's because I'm kind of laid back and I just, I can laugh at some of the stuff I did, you know without taking it too seriously i don't know maybe that's what everybody likes but a lot of the feedback has been that they want to hear more of the personal stuff rather than the blood and guts war stories because you can read the books to get that yep. you know well so. that's why i'm glad i started today off with the training that was a pretty insightful view into special into the group training and to what you went through here in the states so i going back to that I had never ridden in a helicopter until my first time going into combat. I'm sure that was terrifying. Not really. I mean, you know, <laughs> it's a helicopter, you know, you're flying in. But the point being that in our training back in the States, all the helicopters were being sent to Vietnam. So they didn't have any helicopters for us to be trained with. Then when we got to uh, fifth group, and we went out on that island on the second week of our kind of indoctrination training that everybody went through. Um, I got picked to demonstrate the McGuire rig, which was used to, if they couldn't land choppers, they could pull you out on strings. And I got picked to demonstrate that. Again, it's something in today's world, they, they go, they learn all that in their training. And their training is a lot longer and a lot more rigorous than what ours was. They still need warm bodies, but it, it wasn't quite as bad, you know, as it was back then. Sure. So there's a lot of these training stories that we learned as we went, you know. Um, yeah, you spend a couple of hours in a classroom talking about ambushes and types of ambushes. But until you get out there and actually practice for them and set them up for real, that's when you learn how to do an ambush, you know, that kind of stuff. So there, there's just so many things that 
we didn't learn in training. We learned as we went. And, you know, when you're doing it that way, a lot of mistakes are made and whatever. But um, um, so, um, you know, just got a message from Bud Gibson. I sent him a CD of all my pictures. He said he just got it in the mail. Um, so anyway, uh, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of stories. And every one of the guys can tell different stories or similar and similar stories. Um, um, one of my buddies, he was my roommate for a while and I hadn't talked to him since hell, the beginning in 1970. And he saw me on Facebook on one of these SOG groups. So we've been talking on Facebook and two weeks ago, we spent about two and a half hours on the phone talking. And again, it's one of these funny stories that you can laugh about it now, but he says, uh, do you remember saving my life? And I said, uh, no. And he said, well, I had a, the cameras that they would give us to take on missions to take pictures of stuff like pictures of convoys or camp areas or whatever. Um, was a, it was called a pen P E N double E S two. And it was a, a um, split frame camera so in other words every frame that would normally in a regular 35 millimeter camera would take one picture this camera would take two pictures in that frame so you could get 72 pictures out of a 36 picture roll and i bought one of those again a little uh enticement to the guy at the px and i i had my own camera so my buddy he asked me if he could borrow it to take on a mission. So I let him borrow it. And when he came back and things are settling down, it's like, uh, where's my camera? Uh, you, you saved my life with that camera. And I said, what do you mean? And in a firefight, he was carrying it right in front on a, in a ammo pouch. And during a firefight, a bullet went right through the lens of that camera and the back of the camera stopped the bullet. Or he'd had a nasty gut wound, probably would have killed him. So we're we're laughing about that. You know, it's kind of morbid humor, but we're laughing, you know, because um, I saved his life by letting him borrow my camera. Which, yeah, maybe it's true, but, I, you know, I was more pissed at him for ruining my camera than I was saving his life. But I got over it, you know. So, there, I mean, there's just all kinds of stories like that. Um, that every one of us can tell that some of them, nobody else can tell that same exact story, but others are going to have other stories that are equally as humorous or funny. Well, I think that's what attracts people is the overlapping stories of the similarities, but also the unique different experiences that are true for every single one of you of the small details, the little stories, the personal yeah. details that haven't been told. I think that's like this. I think I told it on on your first interview uh, when I was in the hospital and my buddy showed up at the okay. hospital. You know, how many people can tell that that kind of a story? You know, and it was all just. If he didn't work in that secret communications unit, he'd have never known that I was there. And it was just all these little things that fell into place. And. Me and my mom having the same dream the night before I got shot that I got shot in the left leg and we both had the same dream and it came true. You know, I mean, you know, just a lot of funny stories. Well, so. to end out today, one of, I found this very intriguing with every single Vietnam veteran I've ever interviewed is how small Vietnam really was when it came to running into people that you knew. Or vice versa. I just I find that incredible. Yeah. Well, it's a small world. I mean, what was it in Vietnam? Only one percent of the population ever served in Vietnam. You know. So when you start narrowing that down, like in Sag, at my camp, for instance, at any given time, there was probably not more than. 150 of us 
you you drag that on over six years. Um, guys that extended and multiple tours and all that. Um, how many total guys were ever at my camp? Probably less than a thousand yeah. and multiple tours. So it stands to reason on each tour, you're going to meet new guys. And over a period of time, then, especially if you go back to the States, you run into these guys back in the States, you know, and nowadays between we've got the special operations association and fifth special forces group has their annual reunion every year in September. And I've, been lucky to go the last two years and I'll be going again this year um, with my wife, of course, so she can shoot a sniper rifle again. Um, (laughs) But um, I've run into some guys from SOG. Uh, Vern Ward, who was with me when I got shot the first time, hadn't seen him in 53 years. And I met up with him last year at, uh, at the fifth group reunion. So yeah, it's, and we stay in touch now. But yeah, it, it's um, it's 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 a small, select group, um, you know, of people, and some people you just know the names, but other people you remember them, or you you know, and then of course, as the days go by, there's fewer and fewer of us, you know. So yeah, so. Okay, well, um, whatever you want to do. I'll let you know. Um, I'm thinking this Saturday I'm interviewing a um, a pilot who flew support for SOG. Um, I'm interviewing a Way City veteran. Oh, you got Fran Doherty? Yes, sir. Yeah. So I'm excited for that. That's going to be yeah. fun. Um, I've right been back. trying to line up with Bud. I've been trying to line up somebody like him and me to talk about the differences between what he would see from up in the air and what we would see on the ground under during the same situations. And I, I don't know why Bud hadn't been able to pull it together yet, but it's going to happen. Fran said he's willing to do it. It's just, I think it's a matter of scheduling and whatever. Well, and, I think that'd be a cool insight, but yeah, let's, um, let's see. I would. I gotta look at my schedule. I'm about to help coach soccer too, so it might be next, next week, week is out. Next, next week, week I'm gone almost every day. Next week, so Tuesday through Friday, I've got something every day. So two of those days, I got to go to St. Louis. One day, I got to go to the VA, and uh, so. Well, you know, let's but, make it tentative for how about next Saturday. Well, whatever that is. What's next Saturday? Uh, see here. Let me look at my calendar. 17th. Let's see. The 17th is open. All right. 17th. What do you want to do? What time works for you? Lunchtime, your time? Yeah. You know, one o'clock would give us four hours till supper time. I mean, if we need it, not that, you know, I don't think my bladder can last that long, but I don't know. Um, <laughs> But like starting at starting at um, too late in the afternoon, then we like today we're into, you know, she's got supper in the oven and giving me dirty looks because I told her I'd be done by five. So. <laughs> so, yeah, the earlier we start, the the more time we could have. And it gives the kids time to come up with more questions. It does. So let's shoot right? well, lunchtime, 1 p.m. And hopefully your wife doesn't kill me. She won't. <laughs> She can get your address. Yeah, we have contacts. Yeah. Okay. All right. You guys have a blessed evening. Thank you. See ya. Bye, Terry. Bye.